So, that's like me, I don't a bit of blogging, it's not very popular, some people read it, some people don't. Um, I used to work at Alfresco, and this is useful in this talk because what Alfresco tried to do is take this large Java enterprise scale app and put it in the cloud and hope it would work. And as you do that, you realize that that app isn't the right app for what you're trying to do. It doesn't scale, it doesn't spare, and you can't debug it because it's just basically a, a bunch of applications all on one stack that you can't really do. Um, and when it comes to Hive Home, we're, we're quite lucky because we, we started from scratch. So we built services that were stateless. We built services that run just very simple. We have a website that is just the website. We have a, a back-end system that does just turning boilers on and off and stuff like that. And as a result, we're able to split the services out and do more fun things with them. And I think as we go through this, it'll be a bit uh, more interesting. And I have two favorite sayings. One is think farm, not pets. People that name service, who names their service? Gone hands, who names their service? Yeah, people that, that name their service should be shot. <laughs> servers are not pets. They're not things you want to look after, they're things you want to put down. If it goes wrong, you shoot it in the head and you get another one. So you don't want to get attached to these things, they're not important. Uh, another one, slightly more business focus, is uh, business gets what it deserves, not what it wants. I'm sure you all work at a business where they say, we want continuous integration, we want continuous deployment, we want 100% uptime, it all must happen now. And then what they do is they turn around and go, ah, but rather than do that little bit, can you do this? And then what happens is your continuous deployment doesn't continuously deploy, your continuous integration doesn't integrate anymore. So it's important to realize that you're all doing a good job, you're all doing what you're meant to do. It's not your fault you didn't get continuous deployment out there, it's the business's fault for asking you to do something different. And that's, that's important to remember, you're good people. Right, so I want to go back to the olden days, so to speak. Now, this is how our Fresco's architecture more or less looks. You had an ELB, you had HA proxy just in balancing, and you had the application. And everyone thinks of this as a really simple service orientated architecture. You know, it's like three boxes, big deal, what's going on? But everyone forgets that the application itself is a rather large and complex thing. Inside that application, there might be a messaging service, there might be a, an indexing service, a notification service, and all these other little bits. But no one thinks of it because they're in a, a monolithic application where you have uh, interfaces and classes and objects doing communication rather than a separate web interface for everything. And although this is all right, and you might be here, it's not the best. When something goes wrong, you can't necessarily debug it quickly. And that's, that's where microservices come in, because you're, you're isolating individual components that do one job, and it makes it easier to work out where the problem is. So, five years ago, DevOps was literally going everywhere, right? Everyone wanted to do DevOps, and everyone started going and saying, I need people with the DevOps skill, and they must have lots of it. And they've got these people in uh, from somewhere, I don't know where, but they've got them. And they started implementing this breaking down the barriers, getting operations developers talking more, doing the continuous integration, the continuous development. And you start releasing more often, and you're releasing good code more often, but when there's a problem with your code, you're spending possibly longer, certainly in the old architecture, debugging it, trying to work out where, where that problem's happening. And I remember very clearly, our first, we had an issue with searching, which took, I don't know, you'd search for a certain query and it'd take 30 odd seconds. And because you had to keep going back and forth, going, well, can we prove it's this area? Can we prove it's that area? Can we do this sort of metrics or other metrics? It took a long time to get there. Now, conversely, if you had things like microservices where we had just an indexing service, we can go, the data coming out of the application is good, but data coming out of the search and the index service is bad, then we have a narrow field of scope that we can start looking at and debugging and making things slightly easier to go through. And then when you get to that microservices architecture, you then start feeding to DevOps properly. All right, you don't have one pipeline anymore, you might have 30 pipelines. But you're now release, releasing um, mini eggs worth of deployments rather than golden Easter eggs worth of deployments. And I think that helps with the deployment architecture because it's, it's smaller units, they're better understood, the teams that build them are there and available hopefully to debug them, rather than anyone that's done a monolithic app where you get a no, 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 we only changed one thing, and here's 20,000 other things that we might have changed, but don't worry about that. You don't get that approach anymore with the microservices because everyone's release is important to them. Now, microservices. Yeah, I couldn't fit all the lines on the diagram because it, it would blow your mind. 
So it was a bit of a mix. But the reality is, this might look more complicated than you think, but this was happening already. This was happening in your monolithic application. It's just you weren't thinking about it. You weren't necessarily running these little microservices. You're running the app. But this is communication between, say, the basket service and talking back to the notification service or the inventory or things like that. It was all happening all the time. It's just it was an object talking to an object rather than a separate REST call to a separate service. The difference is when the basket service goes down, I know the basket service has gone down, not that the app is not working correctly. And that, that's where the microservices have come into their own because you're, you're narrowing the field of scope down to such a small area to start with that your debug time drops down. I mean, if you imagine in this sort of um, situation, you put things in your basket, the basket checks your inventory, makes sure the inventory's got the item, you then go and purchase the item, it goes to shipping, so you go through all these separate steps. And they were just hidden before. And I think it's important to talk about certainly persistence one, which I think some people miss. Your database is just a place you write things. It's, it should have its own API in front of it as well. You would have done it in Java or Ruby or any other language if you had like a data access object of some kind. Because you shouldn't write your data straight to the disk because you need that layer of abstraction. What if your database changes? What if you go from MySQL to Redis or whatever? So that layer of abstraction is quite useful. Um, this is hopefully quite a short slide because Microsoft is about doing one thing well and I'm assuming most people have used Linux. <coughs> and then if you realize that Linux has always done one thing well, you, you grep a directory or you grep a file, you take the output from grep and you pipe it into all, you do one filter there, you pipe that into sort. And that concept's been there for a while. And even in Java applications, again, the same thing. People write these uh, interfaces to listen, these packages and these objects inside the application, it's just all been bundled in. The only real difference is people have said, well actually rather than having it bundled in, let's split it out, let's put a RESTful API on it, let's make it clearly defined what comes in and what comes out so we can easily identify what's gone wrong, what, what needs to be fixed, if there is something. Queuing is an interesting topic. You have to think when you're de deploying these services, they're quite small and light and hopefully quite quick, so you might you might not need a queue, but why don't you have a queue to store some processes that you don't necessarily do in real time, but you can do in the background? What happens if you split it out? So think about going stateless and stuff. It's it's useful if your app is stateful or stateless, but sometimes it's not possible. And again, when you're sort of designing these, what happens when you have 500 of these things coming up and down? How do you do the discovery? How do you know that the transaction fully completed before the node was taken away? If you take like an Amazon sort of situation where you're spinning nodes up and down continuously. You don't know if it's halfway through a, connect, through a transaction or so you, you have to have that built into your product to be able to deal with it. And I think some people want to talk about access concentrate a lot on the technology and I think the culture is quite important. Back in the day, again, it was dead free things over the wall and they used to say things like, hey, it works on my laptop, but it doesn't work on your 16 core 600 gig of RAM server, so you guys have clearly done something wrong. <laughs> and that, that's where DevOps came from, right? People are seeing these problems, people weren't talking, so they produce this wonderful little DevOps team, you get a nice little DevOps rainbow where you're all there, and you're all developing tools and systems to help everyone out, and you're doing your nice continuous deployment. And I hope they lot saw the Spotify video a few weeks ago where they actually went putting a single operation person into a team of people building the application as well. And that, that's something we're doing at Hive Home. We have application teams with dedicated ops engineers in there who continually build based on the tools and technology that the core DevOps team decide. So what we're turning the business into is the DevOps team produce a platform. So we have a platform to monitoring, we have a platform to deployment, we have a standard build pipeline and things that people can just pick and choose and deploy. And we find that by having people in the application teams and work as a common set, we hope, and when we finally finish, that when that person disappears, someone in the main team can still support the application because it was done using the standard tools in the standard way and the documentation is in the standard place. Um, tooling is quite interesting over the years as well. If you, if you take traditional tooling, things like uh, Nagios and Munich, Someone said, hey, I want to do X, Y, Z. You'd log in and you'd make the change to that box and you'd do it on the box. As time's gone on, things are playing more self-service. So things like GitHub, everyone signs up for their own GitHub account and then you add that person into your account when you want to use it. So the goal is to make people do their own work rather than the sysadmin slash DevOps people sitting there churning through and doing the work for them. And that's one of the reasons why 
um, we uh, uh, hired or started to produce tooling and technology to do that because we don't actually want to be running the service. It's not our expertise. Our expertise is in choosing the technology and making sure people do things in the right way. We don't know how the Hive web app works per se. We can tell you how to deploy it, but we can't be buggy if the website looks funky. So we try and push that into the web team and make that application to actually then debug that application because they are the people that know the application best. Um, benefits. So I think the main benefit with the microservices is with the appropriate monitoring on the inputs and the outputs and the individual service that you actually save a lot of time with um, the supportability of the platform. So when you hit these issues that are hard to trace, it becomes a lot easier because it's this area has a problem, everything else is green, the basket app has got a problem. So you save a lot of time in getting to the problem quicker. And because it's now a smaller component, the whole business isn't panicking because you can't deploy the app quickly. It's, it's like a 500 megs, or sorry, it's like 500 lines worth of code you have to deploy in a very small sort of I don't know, Sinatra or Flask or Web App, it's, it's such a small component. People don't mind if you push it out quickly without adequate testing because, hey, if it, it wasn't working before, you push it out again and it still doesn't work. You're in the same place. Your app still doesn't work. Um, hugging dinosaurs. I, I spent, to be honest, two hours looking for a picture of people hugging a DevOps slash technical person. It turns out that you people don't like hugs. That, that's, why, that's why I discovered in two hours. Um, so. Dinosaurs, because you're now de delivering a platform to people, you're not stopping them and you're giving services back to them so they can self-serve their own IT. In essence, people will like you, the business will like you for what you're doing because you're not the roadblock anymore, you're just the person who provides the tools for other people to go off and do great things. Um, but happy for one, I, I just like the picture, to be honest. It's, you, you will become the team and the company that is happy and smiling because all of a sudden, you're not responsible for running a lot of this stuff. You're just responsible for the tools that glue it together. When the website's not working, you go, that's great. What does the website team say? And you, that problem then becomes theirs until such point they say, hey, the platform that deploys this, the systems, the architecture that actually puts it out there does not work. And then that's when you start getting involved because that's the skill set you get over time with DevOps. You, you've deployed it, you've done it, you've run it, you've managed it. You don't know the applications. You, you can't try and debug that per se because you just, you're not the right person for that job. The person that wrote it is the right person for that job. Um, and I think if you have that knowledge, you should have the success, baby, because you've done it all. You've actually achieved what you wanted to achieve. Um, and I think that's it. Any questions? Hello. Hello. <laughs> I ask this, you know, as a fan of separation of functionality, something I've been trying to do for years, despite many of the um, To me, the risk is you're moving the problem from interoperability. So you're moving the problem from integration to interoperability. Um, one is easier to test, the other one is easier to fix. I, I'd say that, yeah, so you know the big clear boundaries between what comes in and what comes out, so you can say, hey, this is a problem. Because you have the team of people that wrote that with adequate monitoring on their own system, I don't think it's necessarily harder, right? Because they're still defined a web service that does certain things. They can still write their own unit tests, they can still write their own integration tests with their own product, and they can still have their own monitoring of their own application. So they have visibility of their CPU and all that as well. So I don't think it's harder, I think it's quicker, because when that service isn't working, it's then that's getting called to fix it. So, Sort of answer your question. My fear is ad hoc changes to the APIs. Right, so you, uh, agrees. you have different teams doing different services, containers, VMs, whatever you want to call it. The temptation is to tweak the API to solve their own problems. Yes, and that, that's why this approach only works when you have the clear embarkation and disembarkation points. You I'm must not know clear what you meant by that. So you should version your APIs. I mean, if anyone's seen the White House government status for API versioning, it's actually quite decent. You know, you have a version in the URL, you use the URL in a certain way. If you're going to make a version of your API no longer valid, it should go after N plus one, so it's not immediately disappearing. And there still needs to be that central communication about how you tell people it's going away. And that's where I think the central DevOps team comes in, because they're talking to the individual application team, and they say, hey, they have to make this change because of X, Y, and Z, in two or three months, you're going to have to make sure you'll support the newest version. 
And I, I think it's, I don't think it's a difficult problem to solve. I think it's just a communication thing. So it's a bit like doing with Facebook. Well, I've got no choice to deal with Facebook, but I, I imagine they are less kind to outsource developers than in-house developers. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Anyone? Yeah. If you've already got a big monolithic API, is it always, do you think it's always better to rework it so into microservices, or is this something that you do from, from the beginning? I'd say if you have a big application, as a monolith thing that is an API as well as doing the job, I'd say first thing to do is make some a microservice that is the API gateway almost. So move that away from that. So for a short period of time, you're going to make an API calls to an API on the monolithic application, and then as time goes on, you can just take little chunks of it and move it over. But because you've never got a microservice doing the API layer, you're in control of moving certain components on or off depending on certain users, whatever metrics you want to deal with. Cool. Okay. Thank you, Matt.